Amen. Well, good morning. Good to see each one of you here today. And uh, we welcome those online, whether you're in person or online. Uh, we count it a privilege you've taken part of your weekend uh, just to share with us, to worship Jesus with us. And uh, man, I'm thankful for the presence of God that is here today. Aren't you grateful for that? And uh, we know that when two or three are gathered in his name, there he is in the midst of them, amen? And so if you're watching online, we know God's gonna meet you where you are. And uh, we know that the Lord is doing an amazing work in the people, in the hearts of the people. And so let me just share this real quickly. I know it was already mentioned, but we, uh, we're excited about Freedom Ministries that is at six o'clock on Wednesday night for people with hurts, habits, and hangups. Um, it's an opportunity for people to come and just receive ministry and care and prayer and encouragement. And I love what God is doing. God's already doing an amazing work. And then at seven o'clock, uh, we transition into encounter family service right here. Um, again, God is, is doing some great things there. I encourage you to come and be part of that midweek gathering as well as your LC groups. And Pastor Charlie mentioned, if you are not part of an LC group, this is your opportunity. Uh, we're starting this week. And so you can go to our website, twofallsfirst.com, and you can find our groups there. Um, or you can just find someone that's wearing a, a Life Change shirt, and uh, they would love to direct you as well. Well, we are in day two of our 21 days of prayer and fasting for national healing. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist for us to understand that our nation needs God to move on our behalf. And I was encouraged by what happened yesterday um, at the National Mall where um, 80 to 100,000 people, Christians from all over the nation gathered together to seek the face of God in something called the return. And I understand that we are in a season where we have to return to God. Our hope is not in a person. Our hope is not in a political party. Our hope is not in so many things that we, we have a tendency to put our trust in, but our hope is in Jesus Christ. And I believe it starts with the church. The church has to be the one to say, God, we know that it's our responsibility to humble ourselves, turn from our wicked ways, cry out to you, Lord God, knowing that you are the only one that can bring healing to our land. And I'm trusting that this is the beginning of an awakening. Will you agree with me? The beginning of an awakening across this nation where people will surrender their hearts and their lives to Jesus. So as we begin in prayer today, would you just join me as we pray for our nation and then pray for what God wants to do in this service today. So Heavenly Father, we come before you right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And God, we thank you that we stand before the King who is seated on the throne. And no matter what is happening in our world, in our nation today, we know that you are sovereign. We know that you are in control. We know, God, that you are not taken back or surprised by anything that's transpiring right now. And yet, God, you are issuing a call to your people. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. Father God, I pray that we as a church, we as a representation of the big church in Sioux Falls and even, even in the nation, God, that we would posture ourselves in a place of humility and prayer and turning away from our sin so that, God, that we can see you move on our behalf. Lord, so you can bring healing to our land. God, we know that there's so many things happening right now that, that are disturbing, but you, God, want to come and, and bring the change that we need. And I believe, God, you're gonna bring an awakening that will not only draw people that need to be already with you, but, God, to draw the lost, to bring in the harvest. Lord God, we love you today. God, I pray that as we share your word today that you would give us ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. 
God, whether we're watching online somewhere or we're sitting in this room, I pray that we would lean in to what you would speak to us today. I pray you'd move across this campus. I pray that you would minister to our children and in conversations that, God, we would leave this place edified, built up, strengthened. Because, God, we know there's power in gathering together. Lord, we love you. We honor you. In Jesus' name. And everybody shout out, amen. I heard you online, amen? amen? Amen. So if you have your Bibles, would you go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter four, and we are gonna be going to several different places this morning, and so I do encourage you to take notes and write down those verses. I do believe that God has a word for us, and I will tell you, the Lord has already given the word to me. As we are wrapping up this relatability series today, and we're starting our missions conference next week. Um, God already dealt this message to me. In fact, before you feed others, you got to feed yourself, right? And, and the Lord's done that. But in his book, Why Are We Yelling? The Art of Productive Disagreement, Buster Benson says the key word in our definition of a disagreement, which means an unacceptable difference between two perspectives isn't difference, but it's unacceptable. And once the clash between perspectives becomes unacceptable, our motivation shifts from understanding minds to changing them. And from that shift springs a world of trouble. Can you sense that happening in our nation right now in conversations? online, social media, maybe even with those that you are close to. Now, I'm not talking about negotiating or compromising on biblical truth. In fact, we live in a time where we should defend truth more than ever. Jude says, contend for the faith. Truth is never on the table. And yet, there are many current conflicts today that are based on preference and opinion rather than truth. Have you heard anybody say, I'm not gonna die on that hill? There's some hills you don't need to die on. There's some hills that you do need to die on. But I believe a lot of our relatability, a lot of our interactions today are impacted, affected, because we do not have this idea of understanding one another like we should. In fact, so many are fighting to be right rather than fighting for what is right. Obviously truth, but also relationship. Remember, God has called us and he's entrusted us with the ministry of reconciliation. That God has called all of us to be a minister. In fact, turn to your neighbor and say, you're a minister. You're a minister. Maybe you've not heard that before, but the Bible indicates that God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ministers, we represent him, and God wants to use us. In fact, when we, we fight to be right, rather than fighting for what's right, the focus becomes behavior modification rather than heart transformation. How many know there's a difference? There's a, there's a big difference between just modifying somebody's behavior, getting somebody to act like us and do like us, rather than a heart that has been transformed by the power of God. And, and, and scripture, I believe, very much indicates, and we said this last week, that, re, that relationship is the transportation system of the gospel. In fact, God could have sent a note, he could have sent an email, he could have sent a document, but he sent a person. He sent Jesus to us to dwell among us, live with us incarnationally to help us understand what salvation is. And even after Jesus left and Jesus sent us by the power of the Spirit to continue the mission, he has called us to engage people in relationship so they can know who he is. And, and I believe that we are living in a time where God wants us to focus on the power of relationship to bring the gospel to people in a real way. And so today, we're closing out relatability, and I wanna challenge every follower of Jesus Christ. And I wanna challenge every person that calls Sioux Falls First their home with this. Let's do better. 
Let's do better than the world. In fact, we better never take our cues from the world. When you, when you fight like the world fights, you get bloody and frustrated and discouraged and, and, and it doesn't lead you to a good place. In fact, last week we talked about how um, God has called us to pick up spiritual weapons to fight the spiritual battle that we are in. That, it's, that worldly weapons are not gonna work. Worldly weapons are not gonna, not gonna uh, satisfy the need to drive back the kingdom of darkness. And yet, it's easy for us, there's a tendency for us to pick up the worldly weapons and fight like the world. But God's not called us to fight like the world. He's called us to fight like the children of God, the soldiers of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we gotta do better than the world, but, but let's do better, possibly better than we've been doing. Maybe this is an opportunity for us to look in the mirror and, and evaluate ourselves, evaluate where we are, how we are engaging the world we live in, how we are doing our part to be salt and light and doing our part to bring transformation to a culture. And so for these next few moments, I pray that God would, would speak to you, God would minister to you, God would encourage you, he would challenge you, and he would change all of us to be like him. Because every time we walk out these doors, we are entering the mission field. Every time we go into our workplace or we go into our campus, every time we walk into our home, wherever we go, we have an opportunity to bring the king's influence into that situation. And that's my prayer. When we take the high road and do better, we're actually reflecting Christ to a world that desperately needs him. How can the world know that there's power in the name of Jesus to transform people's lives unless they see transformed lives in us. Again, that's my prayer. So how do we know we're losing the ability to relate to one another? How do we know that? Well, I want you to answer these questions to yourself, and I think these are a good uh, gauge for our ability or our understanding of how we are relating to people. The first one is this, are my conversations driven by emotion or are they led by love? Big difference. How many know love's more than a feeling? How about are my words or my posts considered demeaning or are they edifying? I'm seeing a whole lot of demeaning. It's hard to find edifying, right? Do I always have to have the final word, the final say? And, and only you can answer that. that that's only a, a reflection of, of your personal evaluation of where you're at. But honestly, answering these questions reveal a lot about where we really are. And so today I wanna focus on one verse. How many know there is power in one word in scripture? Right? One word in scripture that changed people's lives. And this morning, I want us to look at one, one verse that I believe has a whole lot packaged in it for us today. I believe it has a whole lot in it for you and I to, to, to take away, for you and I to apply, for you and I to, to implement into our daily lives, into our spiritual journeys that will help us be more effective in reaching people for Jesus Christ, but also be more pleasing to God. How many know your life? We are called to live on the altar. We are called to live our lives to honor and please Jesus Christ in what we do. And so it's not about us, is it? It's all about him. And it's all about what he's doing on the earth. But Ephesians 4, 2, here's what Paul says. Be completely humble. It wasn't enough for him to say be humble. He said be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Bearing with one another in love. There is so much contained in this passage. It teaches us that we are to demonstrate complete humility in all of our interactions. How many know that ego can easily get in the way? 
Ego can enter into our perspectives and our relationships and can keep us from being effective for Jesus. He also said that we are to be gentle with our words, kind, practice patience, not being short-fused, not being reactive, and that we are to bear with one another. That bearing is, is, is more than tolerance, but, it's, but it's, it's willing to overlook faults and me, maybe even opinions that are different than my own. Bearing with one another in love. How many know Jesus, when he was on this earth, he bared a lot with one another in love, right? I mean, you think of some of the conversations he had with his disciples, some of the conversations he had with people that were in the community, people that were far from God. We know that he continually practiced bearing with one another in love. And he's called us to do that as well. So I believe it tells us that love has a high tolerance level, right? Love is not intolerant. In fact, you read through 1 Corinthians 13, it's kind of a litmus test on how you are loving and every time I read it, in fact, this past weekend, I read it at a wedding, and I'm thinking, oh, Lord, help me. Help me be better. If this is what love is, then, then help me be better at demonstrating love. Love has a high tolerance level. In fact, the Apostle Peter said it this way, above all, love each other deeply, for love covers a multitude of sins. So church, if we are going to do better, then we have to adopt kingdom principles for relationship in order to facilitate what God has called us to do as Christians, as followers of Christ in our world today. So I wanna give us four keys. Again, if you're taking notes, I challenge you to write these down. Four keys, they're all alliterated so that you can remember them and so they can kind of be something that will challenge you on a daily basis on this idea of relatability. The first one is this, it's listen. How many of the people are involved in a lot of fast talking today? Fast posting. Only to have to clean up later, delete later. Regret that I said that. Regret that I made that remark. Because there's a human tendency for us to speak more than we listen. And that's why I believe Solomon said in Proverbs 18, 2, he said, Fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinions. How many of you know we live in a season where we're seeing a lot of that? A lot of foolishness. People just airing their own opinions without understanding. The, the Bible indicates to us that for us to gain understanding, we have to be willing to listen. In fact, in her classic Discipleship Journal article, Janet Dunn explains it this way. Unfortunately, many of us are too preoccupied with ourselves when we listen. I would say in, when we hear, we're not really listening, right? But it says instead of concentrating on what is being said, we're busy either deciding what to say in response or mentally rejecting the other person's point of view. Listening to reply rather than listening to understand sabotages our ability to relate to one another and have healthy conversations with people. People need to be heard. In fact, ignoring the need for people to be heard and even to be understood diminishes their value. And yet good listening invites them to exist and matter. And that's exactly why God says in his word, James 1.19, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this, that everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to speak to become angry. There's a whole lot in that too, right? In fact, I shared this a couple weeks ago, but God's given us two ears, one mouth, and the mouth has the ability to close. 
right? So how many know that God created us on purpose and with great intentionality? And even in that, God wants us to learn how to listen and learn how to place a guard over our mouth. Amen? Amen. The second key is learn. This takes a posture of humility because I realize I don't know it all. In fact, there are a lot of things that I don't have a clue about. And I want to learn, and so I need to pause, listen, and then learn. In fact, I think of a church like ours with so many different backgrounds and cultures and nations and generations. I mean, you think about it. I mean, we're like a motley crew, right? Quite a group. And, and yet, as I think about the differences among us, I think, man, I want to learn about culture. I want to learn about history. Man, I, I want to learn about that one that, that went through the Great Depression and had to really trust God and believe God. I, I, want, to, I want to learn about people's pain and their perspective and why they're passionate about certain things. Why? Because that's what we see Jesus did. In his ministry on earth, we know that Jesus was a remarkable listener. That he was willing to sit down and take in whatever people shared with him. He was a master at learning people and, and literally meeting them where they were at. And I think about what God's called us to be. Every single one of us, God's called us to be disciples, right? He's not just called us to be church attenders. He, he's, he's, he's called us to be disciples. In fact, he said, as a disciple, we have to deny ourselves daily, pick up our cross to follow him. But do you know the word disciple, what it means? The word disciple means learner. That God wants us to be learners. I believe all of us are called to be lifelong learners. It's not only learning the word of God, but it's learning how to apply it to life and to relationships. It's learning how to implement it. It's learning other people so I know how to minister to them. It's learning where other people come from so I can gain a perspective that I don't have. God wants us to be learners. In fact, Proverbs chapter nine, verse nine, says it this way, instruct the wise and they will be wiser still. Teach the righteous, and they will add to their learning. I say there's two teachers in life, wisdom and consequences. I want to learn from wisdom. And often wisdom comes from other people. Wisdom comes when I listen, and I learn from the perspective and the history from other people's lives. So let me ask you a few questions that I think will maybe challenge you and maybe be a little bit of a litmus test of how you are learning. Are you willing to ask people questions? Are you willing to ask them questions? Tell me more. Can you share a little bit more with me about that? Asking them a question about what they're, they're sharing. Can you be instructed? Are you teachable? In fact, a, a wonderful woman came up at the end of first service and had the opportunity to pray with her, and she said, man, years ago when I was in Bible college, she said, I remember this instructor told me this, and she goes, it's forever been in my mind, and even as you were sharing today, God brought that back to the forefront and, and reminded me that if you're not teachable, you're not usable. That usability is determined by your teachability. It's very similar to authority. You can't be over someone if you can't be under someone, right? You can't be in authority if you're not under authority. And, and, and it's the same concept, the same principle that, that I have to be teachable if I'm going to be usable. In fact, I believe this is key to growing in our relationship with Jesus Christ and, and our ability to influence other people. In fact, let me just share this. Learning creates a distinction between those who grow up and those who just grow old. That all of us are growing old, right? We're all aging. And yet, choosing to grow up 
is determined by your ability to learn and your desire to learn. I pray that we're learners. Amen? Amen. The third key is lament. Paul says in Romans 8.22 that the entire creation groans because the world is affected by the brokenness of sin. So while we wanna blame things on this or that, we understand the very core of it is our sinfulness, sinfulness in the world. So the sufferings of life, disease and starvation, addiction, loneliness, anxiety, racial injustice, and even death is a reminder that things are not right in this world. Things are not where they need to be. In fact, we know that every person has their own personal pain. Every person is experiencing pain at at various levels and it's very, very individual for them. We don't know what people are walking through. We don't know the battles they're fighting. We don't know their story. And yet here's the good news. God has chosen to use every single one of us as characters in the story of people to help bring empathy and compassion as their story is being written. Bringing the influence of the king. Bringing Jesus in to that situation. You see, while learning is all about head, we know that lamenting is about heart. It's walking with people in their struggles. It's trying to understand where they're coming from so so we know their pain. In fact, lament is a common theme of scripture. And lament was something that Jesus, again, was remarkable at. In fact, over a third of the Psalms has to do with lament. In fact, I know we recall the story of Job. And even people that don't know the story of Job very well will say, Man, this week I feel like Job. They understand that's kind of like more than a bad hair day, right? It's like a rough season in life. I feel like Job. We know that Job lost everything. Job lost his children. He lost his servants. He lost his animals. He lost his crops. He was suffering with painful sores on his body. But something very interesting happens in the early part of the book of Job. We see the response of his friends. Job chapter two, verse 13, helps us see that, see his his friend's response in this very difficult season. Read it with me. Verse 13, it says, then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. Man, what a, what a passage. That for seven days, they were willing to step into his shoes. They were willing to feel his pain. They were willing to lament and be empathetic and show compassion, not even offering words because sometimes words are what we can't offer. Words are not gonna help. Words are not gonna move the needle, but they they sat there on the ground and did not leave him for seven days and seven nights so that he could experience the love of God through his friends. It's amazing. It's a powerful picture that I believe God wants us to see because this this is what our response should be to the injustices, the pain, the struggles that people are facing that we need to be in tune with that. In fact, here's what I believe. God's called you and I to be solutions to, so, to the problems. God, God's called you and I to carry the healing of God or the deliverance of God or the encouragement of God into every situation. But we can't do that if we're not detecting the pain in people's lives. I mean, we can't offer them anything if we can't see it. And we can't see it if we're not willing to listen or learn or lament and, and say, you know what, I believe God's gonna take your pain and, and we're gonna turn it into prayer and God's gonna answer and God's gonna meet you. And I want you to know that I'm with you and I'm supporting you and if I have to sit on this ground for seven days and seven nights not saying a word and just watch you cry, I will be here for you. 
I will, I will, I will let you know that I'm here for you. What a, what a powerful picture. In fact, there's some things that people go through that we have no idea that we have to be intentional about understanding. I want you to think of a few of them. I want you to think of the black man who has to instruct his kids differently than I do because of some people's stereotypes or biases as racism is still a reality. It might be a police officer who wonders every time they leave their house if they're going to return home to their family in this culture that we live in today. It might be a refugee who has to overcome the heartache of war and what happened to their family as well as the challenges of living in a new culture. It might be an elderly person who's battling loneliness and also the fears of end of life care. It might be the addict whose decisions have disadvantaged them. And even though they're in a better place and they're moving slowly the right direction, they wonder to themselves if they'll ever have quality of life again. And the list goes on and on and on and on. And here's my prayer. God helps Sioux Falls first be a people of empathy over apathy. God, give us compassion. Give us care. Help us to represent you with the people that we interact with. And then lastly, the final key is love. Obviously, this should be the motivation for all of our relational interactions, but I specifically want to talk about how love is an action word. Love is not a feeling. Love is not just words we say, but love is something we demonstrate in a tangible way to people. In fact, 1 John 3, 16 through 18 says, this is how we know what love is. You've heard this song, I wanna know what love is, here it is, right here. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. So I know, I know my responsibility to speak love, speak life, because there is power in my tongue to bring life or death. But I know even beyond my words, God has called me to demonstrate love in practical ways. Even as Jesus demonstrated his love, his love to us by walking the Via Della Rosa and giving his life on the cross, he's modeled to us the sacrificial expression that love is really supposed to be matched with when we say we love people. In fact, this is our time. You know, we live in a time where love has really been distorted, perverted. In fact, sometimes when you hear somebody talk about love or something is mentioned, maybe one of the celebrities in Hollywood talk about love, you're thinking, oh, that's not love. That's not it. And there's something in your spirit that, that opposes this idea of this being love. And so we know that the world's confused about love. We say, we, we love you and God loves you. Man, man, there's so many things tracking in their mind. So, so how do we speak it but then demonstrate it? it it's not just, it, it's, it's show and tell, right? It's, I don't just tell you, I have to show you what love looks like. And, and, and you know what, I can't detail that in every situation that God places you in. I will tell you that God is giving you an amazing platform in a world that doesn't understand what love is to show them the love of Jesus Christ that is authentic and real and tangible and they can experience it as well. Amen? This is our time. This is our moment. In fact, as we walk in the Spirit of God, here's what God's gonna do. God is gonna lead you to needs for you to fill. God is gonna lead you to needs. He's gonna lead you to sick people because he wants to use your faith to pray for them, to experience healing. God is gonna lead you to people who are struggling and battling addiction. 
Because God's going to use the keys in your heart, in your life, to be able to unlock the chains that bind them. God's going to use you to someone that's discouraged and ready to give up and and, and maybe even ready to give up on their life. And God's going to use you to come in to that situation and offer hope and encouragement and a reason to get up in the morning again. He's going to use you and I. This is our opportunity to show the love of Jesus. And here's the thing about relatability. When we do that, the world is able to better relate and understand who Jesus really is, right? How many know a lot of people have misrepresented him? And God's called us to represent him again. So I wanna close with this story. This moment in history. Some of you are old enough in this room to remember when this all happened. But in 1961, The Berlin Wall was built that separated Germany into two nations. Even the capital city of Berlin was divided, all because of communism. This invasion of communism upon these people. Well, eventually communism became illegal, but the wall still stood. It wasn't until a year after it was illegal that the wall actually came down. And yet in that middle season, in that process, there were some young people that became frustrated and discouraged by this representation of communism that had not come down yet. And so they came up with a plan. They all began to grab their pickaxes. And all these young people, this generation that said, We want to do away with this wall of division for good. We want to do away with this wall that separates, this wall of hostility, this wall that represents communism and oppression of people. And and they begin to show up with their pickaxes. And one by one, these young people begin to swing away at this massive structure that they realize there's no way that I'm gonna even come close to taking this down, but I can do my section. I can do my part, I can do my area. And we know that eventually, 1989, about a year later, that the wall eventually all came down. And and here's my challenge, church, that we know that the walls of division that exist in our culture and our time, our day, are insurmountable. Man, when you think of COVID-19 and you think of racial division, you think of the political turmoil, you think of election year, I, I don't know about you, but I've been exhausted. I've been exhausted. I mean, everything seems to have conflict. Everything seems to be divisive. And we're looking at this huge, insurmountable wall and it says, how can I even make a difference? And here's what God is saying. Will you pick up your pickaxe? You can't do it all, but you can do something. You can do your part. You can take out your section. You can say, you know what? I'm not going to allow division. I'm not going to allow relational separation. I'm not going to allow this, this conflict to continually be part of my life. But I'm going to be, I'm going to do what God's called me to do. And I'm called to be a peacemaker. And I'm called to the ministry of reconciliation. And God has called me to make a difference in the day that I live, even if it's just my section. So church, would you stand to your feet right now? And if that's you, if you're saying, I want to be part of the, I want to be the answer, God. I want to be part of the solution. Would you lift your hands in the air right now and begin to cry out to God and ask God to fill you with a fresh baptism of power that his spirit would come upon you and realign your heart and realign your thoughts and say, God, we will be a light. God, we will be the salt. God, we will make the difference in the day, in the hour that we live, God. God, but you've called us to make them happen. Father God, I pray that you would inject in us such a boldness and a courage to reach people and to minister people in the darkest places, God. Jesus, Jesus, we cry out to you. We cry out to you, God. We call on your name, God. God, we are not under our orders. 
We're not under the orders of a political party. God, we are under the orders of the king of the universe. Father God, we submit to you. We surrender to you, Father God. Help us, God, to live our lives to please you. We are not man pleasers. We will be God pleasers. We will honor you. We will elevate your truth. Father God, I pray in the name of Jesus that we would be a unified people all swinging our Holy Ghost pickaxes to take down the walls of division that separate, separate us even from one another, God. Lord, I pray that, Lord, the healing and I pray for the mending and I pray the, the pursuing peace with all men. I pray that that would happen at the church first. I pray that we can lead the way. I pray that we can lead the conversation. God, we know people are, are seeking, they're searching. They're overwhelmed, they're discouraged, they're confused. God, help us to step into the light and do what you've called us to do. Heads bowed and eyes closed across this place. Also speaking to those online today. Maybe you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Your relationship with Jesus Christ is something that was paid for because he went to the cross for you. And maybe you're here today and you don't have that. The Bible calls it eternal life, salvation, eternal life, which means you will spend eternity with him. You won't have to question that. If you surrender to him now, heads bowed, eyes closed, if that's you, that's you in this room and you'd say, Pastor Quentin, that's me, I need a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've been running from God. Maybe you, maybe you've never, never prayed the prayer before. Maybe you've been playing church. I don't know where you're at. But you're saying, I need a relationship with Jesus. It'll center me. It'll strengthen me. It'll help me navigate through this crazy world. If that's you. I've not been living for him, but today I want to make that decision. I need Jesus Christ in my lift. Lift your hand real high. Anybody here? Anybody here say, that's me? Lift your hand real high. That's me. Amen. Amen. Hands, several hands, several hands in the balcony as well. I'm watching you online as well. I know there's some of you that may say, that's me. So here's what we're going to do, and we're going to give instruction for those that are watching online. Whether you're in the room or online right now, would you just pray this prayer with me? If you raise your hand, and the entire church is going to pray this prayer as well. Dear Jesus, I thank you for coming to this earth, living among us, living a sinless life so that you could go to the cross and die for us so that we could live, so that we could have forgiveness of sin, so that we could have eternal life. God, I receive your gift today and I now declare that I am a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's celebrate those that gave their life to Jesus today. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And we just want to say, if you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family. We're so glad you're in the family. There's nothing you have to do to prove yourself. You're in the family. He paid for it, right? And if you're, if you're watching online, I encourage you, our online pastor, just put, I prayed that prayer, and, and they'll, be, they'll reach out to you. Or if you'd rather send an email to info at SiouxFallsFirst.com and let us know you prayed that prayer. Because if you're living in a different place, we'd love to connect you to a church. If, if you need material, we want to make sure you have material. If you're in this room today and to pray that prayer, um, I want to encourage you to go back to Next Steps area and, and let them know you prayed that prayer. And um, we'd love the opportunity to, to help you, and you as you begin your journey. Uh, you can also go online as well and, and let us know. But we're, we're grateful for what God did. I'd like, to, I'd like to real quickly ask our prayer team to come. And we're just going to close with a song of, of, of worship. 
in honor to God. But if you just come, if you, if you need prayer today, uh, we want to be we want to be sensitive to where you're at because you may feel like Job today, right? Maybe you didn't have it quite as bad as him, but maybe you feel like Job. Like I've, I've been through some things. You have some friends up here that are willing just to embrace you and pray with you and encourage you. And so as we sing this last song, if you need prayer, please come.